Good morning, everyone. Let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 1, verse 12 to verse 14. Acts chapter 1, verse 12 to verse 14. Um, Since it's only just a few verses, let's all read together in one voice. Let us begin. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It is a great privilege to be back to preach the word of God to the saints of the um, EPC English congregation. Um, I just noticed, but I felt like last time that I was here, I think it was also Deaconess Esther uh, who prayed. So I still, I distinctly remember, it was almost like a deja vu saying like, I remember this, but yes, it's a great to be back. Uh, I'm, thank, I'm thankful that um, Pastor Paul had invited me to come speak. As many of you know, uh, I have a wonderful privilege of leading the youth group for our church. It really is a blessing to have many students also from the EM join us and participate in many of our events and also our worship service. It, is especially, it was especially great to see many of them in our um, annual winter retreat last year. It, it still feels a little weird to say last year when it was just a couple of weeks away ago. But we have many, and we also have many college students that I, I'm seeing over on that side, I think, who joined and volunteered to come and serve this year. I was especially blessed to see many of them engaging with our students, praying for them, and running around just enjoying themselves and also fully enjoying and glorifying God. I still feel like I'm recovering from this retreat. I can't say I'm old because I think there are many of you who are much older than I am. I guess I'm just weaker in in my um, physique. But I can't deny that physically it really had a big toll on me and it's taking a bit longer to recover. Now, I also had to uh, recover and take some time with my family as the, almost the whole month of December, I was at church preparing uh, for this retreat. And when I actually came back, um, I actually got to take some time with my two boys. And I noticed that there was a change in my first son. His name is Josiah. And he had to wait four full days without me throughout the retreat. And as we all know, waiting is not the easiest thing. I think we can all agree that we don't enjoy it that much. You know, when I returned back from retreat, my first son, Josiah, was extremely excited to see me, but I also noticed that he was slightly different compared to a few weeks back. He had become more fussy. He had become more clingy to me. And when I searched up on Google about like the growth about toddlers, because I'm just still trying to learn, I found out he's at a stage called the terrible two. And I'm sure many of you actually know what that means. For those of you who are not married or without a child yet, it's the time when toddlers are extremely frustrated all the time. The child is growing up and is becoming more uh, aware of the surrounding. There's a lot more things he desires. There's more things he wants to do, yet because he, he is weak or because he's small, he can't do it. And he's constantly frustrated and needs to ask people around him to do and get the things he needs. He has to wait until he is more developed to fully enjoy the things that are around him. 
For a toddler, the period of waiting is learning to work with other people bigger than him, learning ways to get others to do what he needs, whether that's through shouting, fussing, or sometimes learning to obey whatever his parents tell him or her to do or not do. In a, sim in a similar way, our lives consist of many waitings. Yes, we are grown-ups, so it's different compared to a toddler's waiting. But we face many other issues in life that requires us to wait. Jesus' disciples, in the same way, had to endure, endure many waitings. During the ministry of Jesus, though they misunderstood him, they could, they could not wait until Jesus was lifted up as the promised Messiah, the King. After seeing the risen Lord and witnessing Jesus being ascended to heaven, they were once again commanded to wait. Jesus commanded them by saying, wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit that, he, that God had promised them. During, this time, they, during the time that they were waiting, they could have done so many things after all that they have witnesses, witnessed, yet Jesus required them to wait. How would you feel, or how do you usually deal with times when you are forced to wait? It may seem like waiting is a peri period of inactivity, but through our passage today, it reveals that God uses the time of waiting as a time of preparation. Preparation for his work that he will do through his people. So that through the time of waiting, God equips his people to practice three things. To practice obedience, fellowship, and prayer. So first, God equips his people to practice obedience. Let's look at verse 12 and 13 of our passage today. Let me read it for us. <clears throat> then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jer uh, Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journeys away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Pe Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and, the and Judas the son of James. Notice that they did not write, uh, they did not, sorry, notice what they did right after they saw Jesus ascend to the heavens. They did not go and do whatever they wanted, but they obeyed Jesus. Earlier, Jesus commanded them to not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of the Father. This might, so waiting for them might in that situation, seem like the most logical thing to do for the disciples. But if you think about what they did, even after seeing Jesus resurrected from the dead, it shows how they are learning, finally, to obey Jesus. If you think about all these disciples, these were the guys who could not stay up with Jesus to pray the night before Jesus was arrested. These are the same people who all dispersed when the Lord was arrested. They saw Jesus resurrected, but they went back home to do their own thing. They went back to Galilee to be fishermen again, and the Emmaus disciples went, were going back home to Emmaus. At this very moment, they could have just said, Hey, Jesus left us. He says he'll come back, but we don't know when that's going to be. Might as well just get back to life. Or it could have been the other way. With all the things that they have witnessed, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and everything, they may have felt the urge to go out and evangelize and declare the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But they decided to obey. They didn't obey because they understood where Jesus was coming from, but now they truly began 
to trust in Jesus and his commands. Oftentimes, we learn most about obedience in situations in which we can't see why we're called to do what we are doing. If we can actually give a reason for what we are doing, then we are not necessarily learning obedience from that situation. What we are merely doing is trusting our ability to reason things out. We are doing what we are doing because we think it is the best thing to do at that given moment. <coughs> and again, there's nothing wrong about reasoning your way out of whatever you're, go um, whatever you're going through. But it's quite another thing to learn, about, learn obedience when the command that we are, we are to do doesn't seem like the best option. I know this may be the case for our English congregation at this time, as you are now facing a time of waiting. I know how long it's been since the search for a system pastor had taken, and now it's another season of waiting for a new leadership. For some, this may, be, this may not be anything new because you had gone through this many times or have gone through this in the past. For, but for some, you may be entering a new and difficult season in your spiritual life. No one knows how long this search will take when the leadership will be restored. Yet, our Lord commands you to trust Him. Obey His command by trusting in Him in your time of waiting. Trust that He knows the needs. Trust that He is with you through this whole process. Trust that He desires to provide a new fitting shepherd for this community. Furthermore, through this time of waiting, God desires to prepare all of you to obey God in this way through this situation. Trust Him. No waiting is inact inactivity, but it is a preparation. Second, God equips His people to practice fellowship. Once the, once the disciples returned back to Jerusalem, they gathered in this upper room every single day. All 11 disciples that were named and the women, including the mother of Jesus and his brothers, were present. In verse 14, it says that they were in one accord, meaning their hearts were one. They were one-minded. They were fellowshipping one another every single day. They were recognizing that they needed one another during this time of waiting. And we see that in ourselves as well. There will be some who are used to waiting. But at the same time, there will be those who are discouraged by the upcoming seasons of waiting. The disciples were fighting against this by coming together to encourage one another during this season. God used this time to bring the disciples back. To heal their distrust for one another. Jealousy over one another and to make them one coherent body, preparing them for the work of the Lord. In the same way, some of you may feel the uneasiness of coming to church, especially if you are new to this church or new to faith. Or for some, you may have never experienced a pastoral, pastoral change or transition in, transition in your life. The wait that you may have to endure may be longer than you expect and the temptation to leave the church or the feeling that no one is helping you through this walk of faith may be a big concern. This is where the leadership needs to step up and help the leaders navigate through this time of waiting. This can genuinely be a time where God prepares the ministry to bring all the saints to have one mind and to seek for God's will in this ministry. 
This is a time where true growth can happen and growth do happen. True bonding and fellowship can happen in the Lord as a community strives to recognize the need for one another and being more attentive to one another's life and their spiritual walk with God. There is a reason for you to be here, whether you are on the receiving end or the giving end. God has commanded the time that you were given to develop fellowship, to edify one another, and to build up this church by the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Finally, God equips his people to practice prayer. Let me read verse 14 one more time. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. All the disciples, all those who were gathered, devoted themselves to prayer. Prayer is probably one of the difficult things to do. It seems logical that, yes, we all know that we need to pray. But oftentimes, we find ourselves avoiding prayer or avoiding the meetings of prayer. I, when I look at myself, I still find myself struggling to pray at times. It doesn't come naturally. I have to discipline myself to pray to God each day to write down the specific prayer request that I need to lift up to God and the names of the people that I need to pray for. But most of all, I need to pray for myself. I need to discipline myself to trust in the Lord in all situations, knowing that He is in control of all things. Prayer works hand in hand with waiting because we have to wait on God to fulfill His will. Prayer is a, is a way of expressing the needs and the feelings that we, we are going through each day, lifting it up to God, trusting that He is hearing us and also is responding and working through the prayers that are being lifted up to Him. Although prayer seems like, the again, is the most logical thing to do. But oftentimes, I don't feel like waiting for God's timing in my life or in any of the situation that believers face. The frustration builds when things do not go as planned. But waiting and prayer brings us back to where we need to be. Prayers brought the disciples where they need to be. Prayer was a unifying bow for the congregation, seeking for the Spirit to come together and empower them. Prayer is an act of trusting God. It is a full trust that God is in control of all things. And even in the midst of uncertainty or all the waiting, it is a confession that we still trust in God, even though we don't fully understand. The disciples did not understand what this gift of the Holy Spirit was or what it could do in their lives and how it can transform all of their lives. But they trusted in God by praying. And God prepared them through this time of prayer because just in few days during the festival of the Pentecost, God used his disciples to preach the good news of Jesus Christ to all those who came. And over 3,000 people believed and confessed in Jesus Christ. We are called to pray. I know this is, this is something that we all kind of know, but then we have to remind ourselves. We have to continue to practice prayer in our lives. We are commanded by Apostle Paul to pray continually. It's not a, me a metaphorical command, but whether we are at home where, or whether you are at work, you are to continually pray in your minds, in your hearts. 
whenever opportunity arises, pray. Pray for one another. Pray for the church. Pray for the leadership. Pray for those who are weak. Pray for those who may be struggling. Pray for yourself. Pray that you will trust in the Lord and his plans and his timing for all things that he is doing. Why not begin by trusting God with your struggles in your prayers? As we think about how the disciples were renewed and changed through this period of waiting, I believe that God calls all his believers to take this time, this season of waiting in the same way. It's a time when God trains his people. It's a time where we clearly think about the commands that he has given to us through the scripture. We are commanded to trust in him. We are commanded that he is in control of all things. We are commanded to lift up ourselves to him and our weaknesses to him. At the same time, the church is called to fellowship together, come together, encourage one another, support one another, and through that process, pray for one another. Look around and see if there are any people who are struggling. I truly believe during this season where there is an empty vacuum of leadership in, in a pastoral side, it may actually reveal some of the weaknesses, some of the struggles that were not revealed when the pastor was present. You may, be, you may be able to encounter a weakness that you never really may have thought of, the questions that you may not have thought of in the past. It may also reveal the things that you've been trusting over against God. The fears may take over your heart not knowing what kind of leadership would, would come or when this would actually happen. But remember, this church is not a mere human institution, but it is the body of Christ. And God has sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross to save this beloved body of Christ. And you are part of this body. So remember, this, this time of waiting isn't a time of inactivity, not on God's part, not on your part either, but it is a time when God is preparing you for his next step, for your growth, to, and reveal your weaknesses, your fears that you have, that you may not have noticed before. And it is a time where you Comfort one another, pray for one another, support one another, and look to God. Help others look to God so that in his time, he will bring the good, the, a fitting shepherd that God has planned. And you will be ready to receive the message that God will speak through this new leadership. And I, can, I, cannot only, I cannot imagine the great blessings and the growth that God will bring to this body of believers that God dearly loves and cares about. So again, trust in the Lord. Obey him. Practice fellowship with one another in a deeper way. And also practice prayer. Let us pray.